Thank you. This is a talk about some uh, preliminary work in uh, using the HARP facility and a distributed uh, network of radio receivers uh, maintained by volunteers. And specifically, this is towards the objective of improving our models of the ionosphere. Um, I probably don't have to defend citizen science in an audience of, of meteorologists since there's a long history of citizens participating in me meteorological research, particularly in the United States, since uh, Tom Thomas Jefferson's plan back in 1776 to issue every single Virginia citizen a thermometer, a wind vane, and uh, logging instructions, a plan that essentially continues to be implemented today. But I'd like to start with a quote from meteorologist Doug Wesley that helped uh, change my mind uh, as far as uh, the role that I think citizen science uh, scientists could play in space weather research, and that is uh, sheer numbers outweigh problems. Would you rather have five perfect observations or 100 of which 80 are good? And with the re recent proliferation of, of inexpensive internet connected uh, software defined radios, I think we, we really have an emerging opportunity for rather transformative research into ionosphere impacts on HF radio propagation, which is probably the single most important reason why we even care about the ionosphere. And the, the map on this slide shows uh, the intensity of web traffic to a little web page I created called Gakona Harpoon that I set up to provide information on HARP during the very first campaign run by the University of Alaska. And if you're not already aware, HARP is a giant HF radio transmitter uh, for active experiments in the ionosphere. Uh, directly overhead the facility, and it has quite a reputation among conspiracy enthusiasts, so the web traffic was not entirely unexpected. Uh, wh what I began to realize, though, was that there is a substantial interest in HARP by radio enthusiasts, hams, and shortwave uh, listeners, and this map actually turns out to be a pretty good proxy for the, the network of radios that these enthusiasts operate and maintain. And that network turns out to be a pretty great scientific instrument for some tasks. Uh, so here's the, the overview of the HARP facility and, and the experiment I want to talk about here um, at the High Frequency Active Rural Research Program Space and Radio Science Laboratory that is now owned and operated uh, by the uh, Geophysical Institute at the University of Alaska. Um, HARP consists of a powerful high-gain HF transmitter seen in the center of the image and an evolving suite of diagnostic instruments at and nearby the facility for studying the radio ionosphere interactions. But for this experiment, the diagnostic instrument I used was not located at the site, rather it was a worldwide, this worldwide network of, of radio receivers and transceivers maintained by volunteers. And while the HARP transmitter is usually used for ionosphere modification experiments, it doesn't have to modify the ionosphere at all. It could be operated in a low power mode. Um, it's extraordinarily flexible and can be used as, as basically a low-power broadcast station with a directional antenna that has highly flexible modulation and amplification capabilities. So this shows an overhead view of the HF antenna array at HARP, which consists of 180 towers of cross-dipole antennas. Each dipole is a 10-kilowatt uh, transmitter for a total of 20 kilowatts per tower. And UAF has been bringing the entire array online after being transferred ownership, basically by refurbishing all of the tube amplifiers uh, one column at a time. And we only have one more column to go, but recently we've been uh, working on some corrective and pre preventative maintenance on the electrical generators. Uh, there's five of them that power the facility, so we've only recently been able to operate various fractions of the array. And that's really okay for most experiments, especially this one. Uh, in fact, a lot of great radio science can be done with only a single uh, single tower, which, you know, as I mentioned, is a pretty formidable 20 kilowatt shortwave transmitter. Uh, and one tower can be even powered off of the local electric grid, which creates an opportunity for uh, long duration experiments that say study link reliability, at least for links originating in Alaska. And normally when we do experiments at the site, they're all bundled into experiment campaigns lasting about a week, uh, a few times per year. So the other component we want to talk about is the VOA cap model for and um, <clears throat> and the high latitude ice pack model for HF propagation that have their roots in the ion pack empirical model developed in the 1960s. Both models are primarily used for one of two purposes: statistical estimation of link reliability over some future time period, or 
uh, for coverage maps of signal strength for a given pair of transmit and receive antennas. And on the right are two quick examples of link reliability calculated with VOA cap for late July 2017 for a transmit station located at HARP in Gakona, Alaska. And the top image is for a receive location located in Denver, Colorado. And the bottom is for a receive location located in Milan, Italy. And I chose these, these two locations because they both have rather enthusiastic uh, and uh, volunteer radio listeners that have tuned into previous HARP campaigns and have sent in reports. And the plots both show um, that it should be quite easy to reach, uh, that both locations should be easy to reach from HARP with the 40 meter band, about 7 megahertz, at both 1900 hours and at midnight UTC, the times of the experiments that I want to talk about, while neither location should be reachable at the uh, 80 meter ham band, or about 3 megahertz, and uh, more about that in a moment. The VOA cap model components basically consists of, of, of three parts, a model of the transmitter itself, in this case um, HARP, a uh, model of the receive antennas used, and this is sort of the challenge in using uh, this network of, of volunteer uh, receivers maintained by volunteers since we have a lot of them and no control over them, but this is really where that quote from Doug Wesley applies where 80 good data points out of 100 are preferable to five good, uh, five perfect data points. Um, and, and we usually have a pretty good idea of what those receive antennas are, usually horizontal dipoles at 80 and 40 meters, or sometimes magnetic loop antennas for the receive only stations. Uh, but what, what we're really trying to achieve is to improve our ionosphere models, which in VOA cap and ice cap are basic Chapman layer models. And so are these Chapman layer models uh, empirical models really sufficient for modeling HF propagation, or should we do better? Um, and now we really have a chance to thoroughly find out, and it really doesn't cost that much to do that. Uh, the last component that's required is, is, is to how to catalog and, 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 and receive uh, reception reports uh, from a large variety of, of locations. And fortunately, there's a, several software packages in wide use that automate these reports called SPOTS. The freely available software package, WSJTX, is one of them, and it supports the WHISPER protocol, the Weak Signal Propagation Reporter protocol. And basically, WHISPER consists of a two-minute, very narrow bandwidth, about six hertz, uh, amplitude modulated encoding, about one and a half baud, uh, and, and that encodes the transmitter call sign, power, and grid location. In addition, there's sort of an agreement uh, where, where people will begin to uh, transmit and listen on even numbered uh, minutes at specific frequencies in the ham bands. And when a spot is received, that transmit information in addition to the receive time, the receiver location, and the receiver uh, uh, call sign location are uploaded to the WhisperNet database where they can be extracted by anybody and plotted on a map such as this one. So the HARP experiments were pre-announced through various channels in news and social media and consisted of uh, whisper transmissions from HARP and the operation modes included vertical beam for NVIS propagation, low elevation beams are about 30 degrees above the horizontal at magnetic north, south, east, and west, uh, high gain transmissions using an 8x8 array and low gain transmissions using a 2x2 array and using either O or X mode uh, polarization. Um, I'll skip this slide for now in the interest of time. It's just sort of a list of all the experiments that we performed at HARP, and, and that way I can spend more time on the results. And this is a sample of those results or the spots collected during the experiments. And in total, over, over the three days, we collected over 300 spots from 100 unique locations throughout the U.S. and Canada. Uh, the nearest spot was, unsurprisingly, uh, Anchorage, and the furthest away was Florida, uh, at Boca Raton, if I recall, more than 6,000 kilometers away. Uh, beam direction and frequency were the two most important parameters determining the number and location of the spots, not necessarily the transmit power, which was either about 100 kilowatts or 1,000 kilowatts. And that Florida spot actually occurred when the beam was directed west, and so I think what they really actually received was the grading lobes, which are quite substantial at HARP when the beam is directed more than 30 degrees off the vertical. Uh, the higher frequency or 40 meter band was less affected by absorption uh, since all of these experiments uh, occurred during the daytime. Uh, <clears throat> and so here's sort of a visual summary of, of those results. Plotting all the spots uh, onto this map, you can kind of see the general coverage 
Uh, no spots were observed outside of the U.S. and Canada. And part of, the, part of this reason is, is sample bias in that there simply weren't very many uh, whisper participants in Mexico, and there weren't many spots from Alaska because there just aren't very many people. Uh, in fact, I knew all of them. Uh, <laughs> and, and so in particular, though, I really want to draw attention to where we did not get spots, which is outside of the U.S. and Canada. So, so n n none in Europe and, and none particularly in Milan, Italy. And so if you go back to that that that, that, that link reliability image that I showed before, that it should have been a fairly reliable link to Milan. And if we look at the VOACAP model signal strength predi predictions, uh, it shows that those 40, those 40 meter transmissions, um, it should have been just about as easy to reach the interior of the US as it was to reach basically Europe and, and Milan. And so the so there's something going on here that, that, that I think deserves a little bit more a little bit more study. Um, so so uh, what's what's wrong with our model? Maybe it's, it's probably the ionosphere model, but it could also be the antenna uh, construction. The 80 meter results were a lot more consistent between the model and the measurements with reliable spots reported from Alaska uh, only. So. In summary, uh, HF radio propagation prediction is a major application of space weather studies, and we are at a point, I think, where citizen science can play a role in space weather research and operations, comparable, I think, to the historic and long-time role volunteers played in collecting uh, observations for meteorology. Um, but before I conclude, I just, as, as a postscript, I want to point out that while this work has demonstrated some scientific applications of using instrument networks maintained by volunteers, the importance of this type of effort to the volunteers themselves shouldn't be understated uh, for two reasons. Uh, first, a healthy dialogue between scientists and the public is important for a healthy and educated society, of course. And second, the citizen volunteers themselves are also largely responsible for funding the lion's share of the, of the work that we do through the taxes that they pay. And so in this plot, the total whisper spots with time, you can clearly see a harp effect in the total number of spots at 40 meters and 80 meters on the two days of the summer harp campaign. But since there were only 300 spots total, this effect is not the result of harp transmissions directly. Rather, it indicates the enthusiasm of the amateurs to participate in a rather unique scientific activity. More people simply turned on their radio systems to operate in the whisper mode, resulting in an increased number of spots between them. And I think that's, uh, that's really pretty great. So thank you. Yes, considered FT8. Haven't okay. quite figured out how to do that yet. Oh yeah, I'm I'm per, I, a participant uh, oh, with, with oh, them, with but the okay, yes. And you guys do have representation at the places like convention, thirty-five thousand ham radio operators. That's Oh, I'm working on that. Perhaps I'll ask Bob. Great, thank you. Another question? Yeah. Um, yeah, I was working with uh, NGIA back in the 90s on upgrading the mic gas and your cap. That model goes back, you know, it has its legacy back in the 40s. My hunch is, I think the model has some problems. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I was worried about is, do you have when you plan to look at the 20 meters, for example, um, I used to do communications with your cell pole. We found that 20 meters was very effective as far as reaching out to them and be well over the top. I, I would love to look at 20 meters, but I believe we'd need a new harp to do that. Just, just us. <laughs>